Hi, and thanks for tuning in to the Path 11 podcast. I am your host, April Hanna. At the Path 11 podcast, we are here trying to deliver leading edge research on consciousness, healing, and metaphysics. And just like you, we are trying to answer the big questions about life. Who are we? Why are we here? And what is our purpose? We hope by listening to our podcast, it will make each day you live on Earth a little easier to understand. And now for today's podcast. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Path 11 podcast. I have a guest that I think all of you are very familiar with. He has been on the Path 11 podcast three times already, I believe, and he's joining us for another show. And we are going to be talking about his newest book called Love in the Time of Impermanence. And my guest today is Matthew McKay. He's a PhD, a clinical psychologist and professor of psychology at the Wright Institute. He's the co-founder of Haight-Ashbury Psychological Services and founder of the Berkeley CBT Clinic and co-founder of the Bay Area Trauma Recovery Clinic, which serves low-income clients. He has also authored and co-authored more than 40 books, and I had the chance, like I said, again, to review his newest book, Love in the Time of Impermanence. And you can go back into our Path 11 podcast show archive. You can type in his name. You'll see the other interviews that I have done with him. And I always tell Matthew that whenever he has something new, please let us know. Come on back because I just love his writing and I love kind of what he stands for and all the work that he does. So it always seems to touch my heart. So Matthew, welcome back to the Path 11 podcast. It's great to be with you. Yeah. So I'm not going to go too much into you retelling your history and your story again, because you have done that a couple of times on a couple of the other shows. But if you just briefly want to let people know a little bit of your story and maybe let's start off right with the inspiration for this book and where talking about love and how it really never dies in an essence and is always with us came to be the inspiration for this book. Yes. Well, 14 years ago, my, my son died. Jordan, his name was Jordan. And I was, as any parent is, overwhelmed with the sense of loss, but also with this incredible need to know, does Jordan still exist? Is he okay? And so I set out to find him and, and I described the search in, in, the, in the book, Seeking Jordan, in you know, all kinds of ways, looking, looking for him through mediums, through various kinds of after death communication. And eventually I learned from the late Ralph Messner how to channel. And as soon as I was able to start channeling with Jordan, I, I was rewarded because now we could have a relationship again. Now, now I could ask questions. He could answer them. He could advise me and help me and support me and guide me. And he could also tell me a lot about the world in the afterlife. But what, what I got from all of that most importantly was that love doesn't die that even though our loved ones can transition to the other side, the love between us is eternal. It remains in place. The loved ones on the other side continue to care for us, watch over us. They're willing to guide and communicate to us when we open to that. And so <clears throat> that was the inspiration was realizing that what, what I thought had been lost continued to exist and continue to exist in a vital, beautiful way. So, so that was the beginning. The other part of what inspired me this book is I've, I've been a psychologist for 45 years and I have mostly specialized in, in couples therapy. And so I've witnessed people losing love countless times. And I've, I've seen how that happens. And I've also witnessed how they regain and strengthen love. And, and so it was important to me to, to write about that, about how, how do we hold on to love? How do we strengthen love? And there are really very specific ways we can do that, that really work. So I wanted to write about that, but Jordan also participated in this book a little bit in terms of channeling and he has things to say as well. So it became a collaboration between us about how to strengthen and hold on to love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, when I was reading your book, I kind of feel like your book did a really good job of explaining the concepts that we hear over and over again of love is the answer. 
Love is the only thing. It all comes back to love. And so I just found that you were answering a lot of questions and also really making me think about love in a totally different way than I had before. And, you know, I loved loved. And you talk about that, how we can sometimes with our language say, oh, I love chocolate ice cream or I love this. And, you know, kind of learning how to define it a little bit differently. But, you know, I had never really thought about the concept of, I mean, I knew it and I felt it, but when you actually wrote it and then you read it where you talk about how the love is eternal, it really does stay, you know, with us. But also having done some couples therapy in my clinical practice too, I too have seen that love in an essence die or just wasn't able to be rekindled between two people. But, you know, you also mentioned that if you examine what truly matters to you, what your life is about love is the force behind all of it. And you gave like a lot of different examples. So I was hoping that you can kind of go into a little bit more about the way that you look at love and how you say it's active. It's not really a passive thing. It's an active thing. Well, that's true. And I I think that this is one of the things that we get confused about love. We think that love is an emotion. We think that it is something that, you know, that this flame that rises up inside of us and, and that emotion is what, is what creates love. It, it, what, it's what, it, what defines love and actually nothing could be from the truth. Honestly, I mean, yes, we have emotions that feel loving, but they come and go and anyone who is aware of that, you know, you love your children, but you know, half the time they're driving you crazy. You don't actually feel love. You, you, the, the, that emotion is not present. You may have you know, a partner that, that you deeply care for, but, but a, a whole lot of the time that, that emotion isn't present. It's in fact, oftentimes the opposite is present annoyance and, you know, or, or just, you know, at that moment, they're not part of your consciousness. So the idea that, that love depends on having this emotion is in, in my view, absolutely wrong. Love is actually about, um, behavior. It's about what you do, not, not what you feel. And so holding on to love is not about holding on to an emotion because emotions come and go. And it, it's about instead holding on to the intention to act on love, to bring love into our daily actions in response and toward those that we care for. So it is, it's a very active process as opposed to this passive, like just, you know, waiting to feel something and then, and then saying, or doing something loving because we we suddenly have a, a a strong surge of, of emotion. And I also, I guess when we began to look at how love has these four components, I don't know if you want to talk about that, that that all of those are part of, of how we can actively hold on to love and make love part of our daily lives. Yeah. Why don't you, since we're on it, go ahead and talk about the four components of it. So, you know, first of all, love is, is, is caring, but it's, it's kind of an act of caring. It's, and of course, caring is you, you're concerned about the, the well being of, of whatever it is, whoever it is you love. And, and so that caring is both a, 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 an awareness. I'm, I'm, I, I care about that, that soul, that person, but it's also behavior. It's doing things that become apparent in the moment that would support or help that person's well-being. And so, so that's a very active process carrying. And the, the second component of love is, is knowledge. It's actually being able to see the person. And, you know, I guess in some ways love is very incomplete if we don't actually know and pay attention to who, who our beloved is. And so, and this too is an active process and it's an, a process that goes on continuously because the people that we love are changing and evolving continuously and all kinds of things are happening to them and th- happening both inside and outside. And so knowing about that and seeing that uh, is really important and, you know, and, and seeing who they really are, what, who, what are their needs, their values, their fears, their preferences, their, their emotional pain, their worldview. I mean, their values, seeing all of that and, and, and staying up to date on it, how that changes and evolves is a crucial, important part of love. And, 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 and maybe, you know, well, we'll talk about pain in a minute, but, but so, and, and that too is a very active process. 
particularly when the person is struggling in some way. What's happening to them? What's going on? What's happening inside? What are they facing? What are they, what, uh, you know, what is this challenge that suddenly has overtaken them? And, and so paying attention to that and asking actively questions about what's going on. So that's the second piece, of, which is knowledge. The third is, is compassion. And compassion is, is, is a very special quality because compassion is attempt, paying attention to, the, to our beloved's pain, to what, to what hurts them. And, and, it, and, and, and the Dalai Lama says it's, it's really two things. It's noticing, you know, the, the suffering and the struggle and the pain of the other, but also having the intention to, to help that person toward happiness, toward relief from that suffering. And so it's, a, it's there's two pieces. One, one is just paying attention and seeing, and the other is actively doing something uh, to support the other. And, and the last thing is, is intention itself. And, and that's what holds it all together. And that's, that's how care, knowledge, and compassion turn into behavior, turn into actual choices that we make all day long. It's, it's that intention that I am going to bring love into every moment of choice in my life. And, and, and a moment of choice, if I could say a little bit about that is when I have strong emotions, when I have strong desires and when I am in pain of some kind, and those are moments where I, I, I often face a choice and the choice is to act on my emotions in some way to try to protect myself from pain or, or my desires or to act on love. And so those, those choices show up continuously throughout every day of our lives with everyone in our lives, all the people around us, those choices are showing up. And so the intention is I'm going to act in lo on love when every one of those moments occurs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I wanted to go back to about what you said a little bit earlier about the difference between emotion and love. Because in your book, you had also stated, let me check my notes here, with something researchers, researchers tell us that emotions last an average of seven minutes. When, when do emotions actually end? And I, I, I was reading that. I was like, well, hold on a second. I remember times when I was probably angry for hours <laughs> and it did not end in seven minutes. And there were parts of the book too, where you kind of talked about maybe like the emotion of lust, right? Where we think we're feeling something and it's like alive within us, but that's very kind of separate, I think, than what love is when you're talking about it in an action form. So can you go a little bit deeper into maybe some of the confusion that some people still might have when they're saying, well, of course, love is something that I feel. It is, it's an, it is an emotion. And it, I, I had never heard that emotions can last an average of seven minutes. So I was curious to know a little bit more in detail about that. Yeah, it, it, this is, I'm really glad you're bringing this up because it's, it's a very important issue, you know, because a lot of times when I'm talking to my clients who are having painful emotions, it's kind of reassuring to them to hear, well, you know, emotion doesn't have to last that long. In fact, you know, average is seven minutes and there's, a, but here's what happens when they get, we get stuck in an emotion, you know, emotions are waves. And so the wave has a natural lifespan and it actually is not that long, but what keeps us stuck at the top of the wave are several things. One is rumination. I keep thinking about the thing over and over and over again. So, and I, and I ruminate about it, ruminate, and that just keeps generating more emotion. It keeps, it keeps the emotion alive and, and, and kind of interrupts the natural course of the, of the wave of the emotion. Another way that we get stuck at the top of the wave is when we try to suppress the emotion. I got to get rid of this. It can't stand it. I have to, I have to stop feeling this. And all of the efforts to suppress the emotion actually make it continue. And again, distort the natural wave process. And we end up getting stuck at, at the top. Then the last thing that gets us stuck in an emotion is when we're acting on it. So for example, with a lot of research on anger, she brought that up. It turns out that every time we act on the emotion of anger, in other words, we're aggressive verbally, or we, you know, we, we, we express anger in some pretty strong way, it actually intensifies and, 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 uh, and continues the feeling of anger long past the natural wavelength. So, you know, you know, rumination, trying to suppress the emotion and acting on the emotion, all three of those things keep us stuck at the top of the wave. And so, and so when we talk about a wave being seven minutes, we're talking about it 
that's that's the natural process of emotions. They even the most tr- the strongest, most intense emotions will tend to pass in seven minutes and very often less, except if we do those three things. So if you don't, if if you're having painful emotions and you and you want to get them back into that natural wave pattern, you have to start working on those three things that that can keep us stuck. Mm, okay. Well, that was very helpful, and I think what that does it also helps to put people in the driver's seat to realize that they have choices that they can make about the emotions that are coming on those waves, you know? So it's like recognizing if you are a ruminator that you can choose to have have a different thought or to carry a different emotion or to have a different behavior to be able to, like you said, come down off of that wave. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. I have a different behavior. So you can act on the emotion. Uh, for, for example, let's say, you're with your partner and they've annoyed the heck out of you or they've said something critical and now you're you're upset at them. And you can act on the anger and and that will actually intensify and, and keep you kind of stuck in that angry place. Or you could sit and recognize this as a moment of choice. Wait a minute, this is a moment of choice. I'm having this very strong emotion and the emotion is driving me to do something aggressive and hurtful. Let me see. What would love look like in this, in this moment? What, what, if I were going to act on love, how could I do that at this moment? Well, for example, I might, I might, you know, you know, act on seeking knowledge. What's, what's hurting my partner? What, what's, what's my, what's going on with my partner that they're critical or upset with me? I, I might turn this into an act of love instead of being driven by the emotion of anger into aggression. So how do we connect this with grief, right? Because some people may say, well, I'm having this emotion of grief because I love my child so much that died, or I love my, my grandmother and, you know, their love could be connected to the grief. How do we, how do we work through grief with love being active and also us, you know, incorporating in the knowledge, the intention to make sure that maybe we're also not getting stuck in a wave of grief that keeps us there for a while. Yeah. So grief, in my view, in my experience, is a kind of um, an indicator of love. It's, it's like, you know, I, I, and, and a loss, it, you know, both things are, are present in grief. And we can, you know, grief tends to make us want to withdraw and shut down. And, and that's one of the one of the outcomes of that emotion or what it's it's a way that emotion kind of influences our behavior. And so the question is, okay, so I'm feeling grief right now. How can I turn this into love? How how can I turn this into love of the the one who's, 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 who's transition is on the other side. And so I, I think one of the things we can do is we can actually send love to that, that soul that's on the other side. We can, so I'm feeling grief. Now let me let me actually send love to that to that soul. Let let me convey how much I love and care for that soul. Not just the how much I miss them, but how much I love them, and how 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 deeply important they are, and and the love between us is. And and I think that's that's a really important way of working with grief is to send love. Yeah, another way of working with grief is is to communicate to that soul. I mean, that, that, I mean, sending love is a way of communicating. But another, but you can, you can learn to channel. It's very easy to learn to channel. Anybody could do it. It doesn't require any special skills, clear audience, anything. And so we can, we can actually communicate and have conversations with loved ones. And we can appreciate that they're in a place of, of great happiness. And, and so, you know, our, our love for them can be expressed in a very active way. And I, so I, I think. And, and to recognize that that love is still alive. It's still there. In fact, it's, it's in a very beautiful and pure form. It's, it's, you know, on earth, our love is, we, we have to struggle because we have to love in the face of pain. On the other side, we don't struggle with, with pain and, 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 and love is very direct, powerful experience. And our loved one on the other side has that kind of pure, beautiful, powerful love for us. And, and in, in a way it's something that we can we can participate in and feel a little bit by opening. Yeah. When you talk about that and you talk about love being action and, you know, what can we do? What's the action that we can take within our grief? You know, it makes me think of 
like you said, you can communicate with the soul that's transitioned. Maybe you might create an altar or maybe you might go to the grave site and decorate it and plant some some nice bushes or flowers or run a race in, you know, a memorial of that person. And I think with the action of love and doing those things can be more productive than just sitting in the emotion of the grief and not having any sort of action, but just, you know, that might go back to like, you know, rumination of it, or just that stuck feeling that sometimes grief can give you. But when you apply action really to anything, and we're talking about loving action, it's really impossible for emotions to stay stuck. Would you agree with that? It action impacts emotion very, very deeply, you know, and so you feel a wave of grief and by the way, grief is another emotion that often lasts seven minutes or less, even though you have multiple waves, the, each individual wave tends to be relatively short and, and in the middle of that wave, we can appreciate that that we've lost this human that, that we love so much in the, in the physical world and we can't hug them and hold them. And there's, that's a, an enormous loss, but we can also at that moment appreciate that the love between us still exists. It's still powerful. It's still beautiful. It's still pure. And that loved one is still actively interested in our lives will actively support and guide us. And we can actively send love and appreciation to our loved one as well. So, so again, yes, in the middle of the grief, we can take action. We can do something. Right. Great. All right. Let's see. I mean, I can give you an example. I mean, when Jordan died, one of the things that yeah. would come up for me is like, I'd have a big wave of grief. And then I would just, I would try to think about him and think about his essence, the, the essence of that soul. And, and then I would send him a big wave of love for myself and an active sense of, of appreciating and just who who Jordan is and, and, and loving that essence of that soul. And so I, I could take the grief and then, and then send it to him back to him in the form of, in the form of love. And that was a very active process that I did over and over and over again. And I think that's something that can help. And all, and all the things you were describing are beautiful ways of helping, you know, d taking some action in the name of the beloved, doing something because that, because of your love for that soul and, and whatever you do, you know, it, it's of service. It does something of, that, you know, creates beauty or helps in some way. So these are all ways that we can actively love. Yeah, there is a quote of Jordan's that I took from the book. So as you said earlier, and those people listening who might have read Seeking Jordan or have a little more background on Matt's work with how he communicates with the son and does some channeled writing in this book, when Jordan kind of comes through his words are kind of more in like this box that you've that you've put in the book and there was one that I really it's exactly what you were just talking about I was trying to find my notes you said let me give this example on the essence and this is the actual quote from Jordan that I took from the book Jordan says you have to see a person's essence with the heart not the mind this means seeing the whole the gestalt of the other the heart doesn't analyze or focus on characteristics. The heart doesn't judge. The heart doesn't like or dislike aspects of the other. The heart sees the essence. The heart sees the beauty and irreplaceability of the other. And what this kind of made me want to ask you about is, you know, if you've worked with clients that have been in dysfunctional relationships, and do you think sometimes that it's their heart that is seeing the essence of the human being and not necessarily the behaviors, you know, where people can get locked into either physically, you know, violent relationships, domestic violence, whether it's on an emotional level, a physical level. People may stay with a person that's struggling with addiction for way too long or there's some other dysfunction within the relationship. And then when it's talking about the heart doesn't analyze or focus on these characteristics, it's just focusing on the essence of the human being. And it feels to me that sometimes clients can stay in those relationships because they can feel the essence of, well, this person really deep down is a good person. And I just wanted to see what your take was on, you know, the therapy that you've done. And I'm sure you've sat in many couples therapy where there was a level of dysfunction and how sometimes people will stay. Is that because the heart is focused on the essence rather than the behavior and the characteristics? It can be. And what the issue, you know, 
love doesn't require us to stay in a hurtful, dangerous, destructive relationship. And, and we can continue to love that person, even though we set boundaries, even though we, we say, this is, this is as far as I can go with you. I, I can't live with you, or I can't, I can't be vulnerable to you in certain ways. As soon as you start behaving a certain way, I, I have to, I have to leave. I have to absent myself. I, we can set boundaries and still love. So, it, 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 and I think that's important to kind of recognize and we can, and, and and it's sometimes people fail to set boundaries because they've turned love into dependence. And I think that's something important. Love is not dependence. It's not like I have to be with you. I, 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 I depend on you for feeling safe or depend on you for not being alone in the world and so forth. Um, so sometimes people get stuck in relationships, not because of love and, and seeing the essence of that person, but because they depended on that person. And, and that really isn't love. And Daniel Brandon, who wrote famous books about love, I would call that D love that that's dependency love. It's not really the, the, the full experience of love. So yes, you, you know, some people get stuck in, in relationships, but it's not really love that usually keeps them stuck. It's dependence. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and you can continue to love someone, even if you set appropriate limits to protect you from destructive behavior. I want, I want to say something else, but the, the thing that really starts to erode relationships and erode love is judgment. And, and, and this is one of the things we have to help people start to recognize. And also it erodes self-love as well is it judging, you know, this and that is wrong with that person. This is good. This is bad. As soon as we start organizing our perceptions about each other or about, uh, about the other myself or others around good and bad, this, this is good. This is bad. We, we, we enter the realm of judgment and that starts to destroy the relationship. It starts to destroy love because love is about acceptance. Love is about seeing and appreciating that, that, that human knowing them, caring for them, having compassion for their pain. And so when we start getting into judgment, it, it is the, it's the Royal road to destruction and dissolution of a loving relationship. And so some of the, some of the things that we have to start working on is how to, how to, how to see and appreciate that person without judgment. Doesn't mean we couldn't have, have to set a limit or even decide I can't live with this person, but I need to start to learn to see this person, experience them at, without judgment, not without that, that good or bad. And so that's one of the first things we have to help people start doing when those judgment thoughts show up, just let's notice that thought, but it's just a thought. It's not reality. And let's return to in the face of that experience of that judgment, how can I act on love anyway? Right. Yeah. And I think you mentioned in there, is it the compassion and equalizing mantra? Just like me. That's I love that. So you give a couple of examples on ways that you can move into compassion. And so I'm, I'd just like to read that. You can let me know if I, if I botch it at all, but Matthew has a mantra that you can practice. And so if maybe you're finding yourself in judgment or need to find more compassion, the mantra that he shares with us in this book is just like me, they want to be happy. They wish not to suffer. Just like me, these people walking by are caught up in the drama and flow of life. Just like me, they want relief and kindness. And then he says, eventually, if you say that enough times, all you need to say is just like me. And uh, that begins to, I guess, soften and bring you into that space of compassion like you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so when you, when you start to notice a judgment about someone you love, <clears throat> then one answer to that is, yes, just like me. They, they have pain just like me. They sometimes cope with that pain in ways that, that don't work very well. So just like me, they struggle and sometimes do things that, that hurt others. You know, just like me, they want to be happy. And, and, and finally, yes, just like me, we, we're all in this together and judgment at pulls us apart. You know, judgment is, is the root of, of really all evil in the world because because love is about, is about joining and connecting, belonging. And the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is disconnecting, judging us and them, tribalism. There's, there's the good people 
and, and then there's the bad people. And, 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 and that kind of, you know, casting people out, you know, they don't count. They're not, they're, they're not important or they, they don't deserve care and love. That kind of thinking is the opposite of love as opposed to hate. And so, and that kind of thinking, the root of that thinking is judgment, these good or bad judgments. And so that, that's why I say that's that, that that's, that's what is the, that's the enemy of love. And that's what every time that I've seen between, you know, couples and, and, and working with them, what, what's eroding love is, is a stream of judgments that they each have about each other. Yeah. The other thing that this brings to mind is, you know, you mentioned in the book that really it's our innate nature to want to bond, right? To want to be with people. Now, what would you say to people who maybe are avoidant of any and all relationships or people that say, I don't like people, you know, I don't like people very much. I like animals and dogs better. Or the person that has been maybe single for a very long time and maybe they really don't have a very large network of friends, maybe like one or two people, but the they get so used to being quote unquote alone in a sense that they may be saying, I don't need an intimate relationship. I'm perfectly fine being alone for the rest of my life. I have no desire to ever marry, no desire to ever have a lifelong partner. You know, what would you say to those people that, because, you know, I question that and wonder about that because I do know that it is in our innate nature to want to bond and to be connected. But I've come across a couple of people that have been very anti-bondage, I guess you could say. Well, you know, there's, there are different reasons that people reach a place where they prefer their, their pet to a human and, and are kind of resisting, you know, to bonding. I mean, in some cases it can be totally legitimate. Persons just like, oh, have more affinity for animals than they do for human beings. And they do, they do bond, they bond with an animal and, and it could be a very beautiful relationship. And so I wouldn't say that that's automatically, you know, something that we have to offer them help or something that has to be fixed. Now, there are a lot of folks who struggle with bonding and are very cautious about relationship who have what we call a distress schema. Something really bad things happened to them growing up. They were abandoned, they were hurt, they were damaged by in humans that should have been protecting and taking care of them, but instead inflicted a lot of pain on them. So they, they have a very natural caution about vulnerable relation, you know, because you're vulnerable. As soon as you start loving someone and caring for them, you're vulnerable to being hurt. Um, and so for these folks who, who have this, you know, deep and understandable distrust, but do also want to connect and the distrust is getting in the way of connecting and loving, there's, there's some really important work to be done because in, in order to move toward that value of, of love, we have to move through a, a barrier. The barrier is the fear of being hurt right. uh, and, and the actuality that oftentimes, you know, I mean, inevitably when you're in a, a, a relationship in which there's love, there's going to be hurt. There's things that are going to happen that hurt you. And so we have to help that person prepare for the fear of being hurt, uh, which is, you know, based on their life experience is very understandable and real, but also on that the, the actuality of being hurt is something that's sort of, you know, baked into relationships that, that relationships are not, uh, are, are not 100% beautiful and positive that there's often a, almost inevitable hurt that shows up. doesn't mean that the relationship is a bad relationship or there's something wrong with it, but we get hurt. And so we have to help the person prepare for that and be able to make room for and accept and to be able to tolerate the hurts that are part of an inevitably part of a relationship without running away. So there's a lot of work to be done there. So I'm, I guess I'm just saying that in some cases people bond with animals and, and have, you know, are very auto independent and that's perfectly fine. That's nothing to be fixed. In other cases, they really want a relationship and the, and the, and the fear of hurt and the distress from early childhood trauma is, is getting in the way and we have to work with that. Yeah. Thank you for that. My other question, which I thought was really a key point, and then I was like, well, hold on a second. I have a couple of other examples that I'm not sure if this if this works. So let me ask Matthew about it. He said, you're likely to find in nearly every case that a dislike that you have for someone is preceded by pain of some sort. 
So we're kind of going back to a little bit of compassion and judgment. So if you're upset with someone, you're disliking someone, you're saying you can usually trace it back to some sort of pain that that person had caused you. And I, I would say for me, you know, when I think about that, that's probably about 99% accurate. But then I have recently, and I think it's fresh in my memory right now, that I had come to meet a stranger, you know, a person, and just being in their presence felt really uncomfortable. Now, there wasn't any pain. This person did nothing to me, but it was just this, just this feeling of like, I would never want to stay in their presence or be with them. I just felt uncomfortable about them. They kind of oozed a little bit of irritability. And, and, I, and it, I found myself kind of disliking being in the presence of this person and really hoped that they wouldn't, you know, come around again. But there wasn't any pain that was initiated. There was pain. The pain was your discomfort. The discomfort. The but they discomfort they didn't. <laughs> was, is, that's the pain we're talking about. Okay. Being in their presence makes you uncomfortable. And furthermore, you noticed, if, if I could, you know, explore this a little bit, you noticed that they seemed a little irritable, which I, which for me, if I'm noticing somebody's kind of irritable, that feels a little dangerous to me. It feels like sooner or later, they're going to, they're going to say something, you know, kind of maybe attacking or judging or a little bit of anger. And I'm, I'm now I'm getting a little, a little on some level, I'm a little scared about that. I'm a little uncomfortable thinking, this person's going to level the boom on me at some point. And so that discomfort and that perception that they're maybe a little bit dangerous because they're irritable is the pain that, mm -hmm. that actually makes you not want to be around that person or, you know, or, you know, or, or perhaps judge that person or push them away in some fashion. And that's it, totally understandable, but that, that's what I'm getting at is that pain in some form yeah. is the root of that experience of like a, no, I don't want to, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be that with that person. I want to get away from it. Yeah. And then there's the practice, right? Of the compassion, checking my judgment a little bit of going back to that, just like me mantra, but also holding a boundary and being okay. If I've, if I'm never in their presence again, I'm really okay with that, but can recognize that maybe some of that irritability comes from their own discomfort or it comes from somewhere and trying to have compassion for whatever that may be, it doesn't have to be in my space or my presence. But if I can go into that mantra that puts me into a different energy and a different set of eyes in the way that I look at them. Yeah, we could have compassion that they've been hurt or damaged in some way that's resulted in that irritability and that, that kind of, you know, pushing, pushing away thing that you, you're noticing. And it doesn't mean that we have to hang out with them. It doesn't mean we have to have a relationship with them, but there are individuals that are in our lives that we have this reaction to, you know, that, that for their, their family members, they're people that, you know, we care for, but we have, we have this kind of aversion to as, as well. And, and it's those people that we have to be then more at. It doesn't mean that you have to hang out with this person that you met that, you know, that you, you didn't feel comfortable with. But, but, the, but there are a lot of folks in our lives that we have a certain aversion to that we, they're in our lives for, for better or for worse. And then we have to find a way of loving them in the face of that aversion. Right. And, and that is an active process. Yeah. Looking, you know, looking at them compassionately and so forth and, and learning about them, not knowledge. What's, what's going on with them if they're feeling so grumpy, you know, what, what what's happening? What, 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 what kind of pain are they in? Right. Oh, so that so then it becomes an active process. Yes, and and one that can take years, right? I mean, that an active process like that could just it, it can take you quite a while to perfect. I would say, yeah. So I I guess one of the last quotes that I really loved from your book, and it's kind of going back to when we lose someone. You said, "Love isn't lost when someone dies; it is transformed from words and touch into telepathic connection." And I thought that was just put so eloquently. I really love that. So maybe we can come back around to that as we're closing our interview. And would you like to talk a little bit on that adjustment of understanding that our love, again, it doesn't die when the person dies or it makes their transition, but it gets transformed into words or into the telepathic connection. Yeah, and that's, I, I just can't, 
say how true I found that to be, that the love is, you know, we can't touch, we can't hold, you know, it's, it's, it's impossible to, to use our, our physical bodies to embrace. And yet the love is absolutely still there and, and, the, and, and it, is, it takes this, this form of telepathic communication and, and you can open the channel to the loved ones on the other side, simply by thinking of them, that they are just a thought away. If you think of that loved one and you think of them with love, the channel opens and you are sending that message. You are sending that message. You're sending your love to that, uh, that loved uh, soul on the other side. And if you let the channel stay open and you can start to receive messages, you can start to receive messages by just asking a question of, of the loved one, you know, how, how are they? Are they, are they happy? Are they okay? And, and start with kind of simple questions like that. And, and then just wait for a felt sense. It just, it doesn't require you to, you know, have, you know, you know, thunderclaps and, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the big voice from Mount Sinai coming down and telling you, something. You, could, you, you just experience it in your own mind, but you can, you can definitely experience, you know, telepathic thoughts coming from your, your loved one. So it's, so that's very possible. I guess I, if I may, I just wanted to end with, with also a thought from Jordan and, and uh, about love in, in this world as well. And he says, love is simple. It's caring for and seeing the other love is doing in each moment what relationship requires doing in each moment what relation with love because love is relationship what what love requires and that's when we talk about the moment of choice all day long we're facing moments of choice that we can act on love or just act on whatever our emotions are driving us to do and that choice is showing up all the time and and that's something that we you know can actually program ourselves each morning to, to recognize the moment of choice today at the moment of choice, I will be loved. And we can start our mornings with that awareness. Beautiful, a beautiful way to end yet start a beginning, right? For all that's how people can start their days. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, Matthew, for being a guest three or four times here on the path 11 podcast. It's always wonderful to have you. I'm assuming people can find your book on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, all the major car carriers of books there. All right, great. And so we'll make sure that we put that in the show links again. It's the title of the book is Love in the Time of Impermanence by Matthew McKay. So I hope you all enjoyed this talk and conversation as much as I did. And I will be sure to bring you another amazing guest next Monday. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's show. If you haven't already, please subscribe and rate and review the Path 11 podcast in Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Also, this podcast is made possible by our sponsor, Path 11 TV. Visit path11tv.com to start a seven-day free trial and start streaming over 100 hours of exclusive video content on consciousness, healing, and life after death. That's path11tv.com and be sure to use coupon code podcast30 to take 30% off your annual membership. Start satisfying your spiritual curiosity with a membership to Path11TV today. Bye for now.